Humility means everything. An attitude of humility will save you. And this is where you have to choose between humility and pride. You know something? Being respected by the international community means nothing if your own people don't respect you. So don't be fooled. I've been meditating a lot on the word attitude, especially since I saw the discovery of Stanford University Research Center when they claim that 12 and half percent of life success is derived from knowledge, skill, and IQ. And 85 and half percent, or 87 and half percent of the successes we achieve in life is a result of attitude. It's, it's, it's really been weighing on me heavily that attitude then is everything. Tell two people, attitude is everything. Charles Swingold, one of the greatest men of God that ever lived said, attitude is more important than the past. Please write it, attitude is more important than the past. An attitude, it's more important than education, than money, than circumstances, than what people do, and than what people say. It's more important than appearance, relevance, giftings, or skill. Charles Swindell, I repeat. Attitude is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than what people do or say. It's more important than appearance, giftings, relevance, or skill. Maya Angelo said, and I quote, if you don't like something, change it. And if you can't change it, change your attitude. I repeat, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. Topic for this morning reflection. The attitude of humility. The attitude of humility. It is said and believed that pride comes naturally or is automatic with men or with women, pride. It comes naturally. And it's mostly revealed when people become successful or when they become achievers in life. When anyone in life accomplishes anything or something or achieves a goal in life, most times they become proud or arrogant because the achievement or the success or money or relevant or skills or giftings puffs them up or in a way tempts them or provokes them to one to believe that they have arrived they've done something they've achieved something and most times they are tempted to take credit for whatever they call a success or achievement in life. And men often have a way of making you to believe, <clears throat> especially in this society when <clears throat> people are poor or struggle a lot and don't have enough to show for, when people do well in societies like our, our society, it's very easy for you and it's very common for people to puff you up, blow your mind, make you believe that you are an achiever and you've done well. And it comes with a lot of accolades 
and a lot of celebration and blowing you out of proportion. And it's one of the reasons why I struggle a lot when I'm invited to receive awards. Because whenever people come to receive awards, they never talk about their struggles and how they got to where they are. They talk about their achievement. And it blows people up. And I struggle with that because I recognize that I am a product of the grace and the special message of God. You, you don't have to clap. I mean, if you want to clap, clap. And, but I have, come, I have come to the realization that, like Paul said, I studied at the feet of Gamaliel, and he recognized, he said, I'm a Jew among Jews from the tribe of Benjamin. And he talked about his background. And yet he said, I count it all but nothing except Christ and whom crucified. And then said, I'm the least among them all. Yet I labored more abundantly, which stands to reason that he accomplished more than all the apostles that came before him. And he said, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And the Bible said, what have you that you did not receive? And why then do you boast and act as if you did not receive it? That a man can receive nothing except it is given to him from above. And therefore, it doesn't matter what your achievements are in life. And one of the only reasons why you are so impressed with yourself and your achievement is because nobody in your family has accomplished anything before. But if anybody in your family has risen to the heights and the pinnacles of life and achieved greatness, and accomplish something, then achievement and greatness doesn't mean anything to you because you are used to it anyway. And the reason why we make too much noise and we go into the attitude of arrogance and pride and we don't have humility in our society as it is required from Bible perspective because there are some things we call humility. There is no humility. Falling on the ground, rolling on the ground, Holding somebody's feet doesn't make you humble. Humility is an attitude. And, and, and we'll look at what humility is, the signs of it and the, the signs or the symptoms of humility and of pride. But if you are used to money and you grew up in money, money doesn't mean anything. And it's the same thing whether in politics or in church or at the marketplace, that people who are used to success are normally not impressed by what people call success because they are used to it. It is people. I took a preacher from Ghana to New York. When we got to Manhattan at night and he saw the buildings and the lights and everything, he said, Papa, this is heaven. He's still there. He refused to come to Ghana. He's left, he left his wife and his children and everything and forsook me. He's in New York. He's there. He doesn't have papers. He's still there. Because Manhattan is heaven. And I can appreciate why Manhattan to him is heaven. Because since God said, let there be light, nobody in his family has sat in a plane before. And nobody has had a passport before. He's the first to have a passport and the first to sit in a plane. So Manhattan is heaven. But if you were born in Singapore, in New Zealand and you've been to some of the progressive communities of the world and you are a citizen of the world there is no way you will see Manhattan as heaven so the reason for people being arrogant disrespecting others and even disrespecting God and disrespecting the church and spiritual authority as a result of some accomplishment, achievements or background whether it is education success, skill giftings, money fame is because they are the first 
in their family to experience that particular thing that makes them pompous, proud, or arrogant. But truly speaking, I've seen billionaires and I've worked with a lot of great people and greatness. And most times, true greatness and true great people are very humble people. They are void of arrogance. They are void of arrogance. And especially all money people are void of arrogance. It's new money that makes noise. When you are driving on the streets of Accra and you see all these latest cars, shining colors with gold and diamonds and this, and they open, you know, what? The, yeah, the top of the, their cars. And they are blowing music. Boom, 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 boom. And they are sitting behind the steering and they are shaking like this. Boom, boom. It's new money. All money don't make noise. You don't see all money with flashy cars. See, I hear you. You know, I had dinner with a president friend of mine last night, and when it was time to go to the table, um, they said, Mr. President, uh, please lead us. And he said, ladies first. And we kept insisting that he should go. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm giving all the ladies at the table the right to go first. And so somebody turned to the foreign minister of that country and said, Madam Foreign Minister, please go first. The president has given you the blessing. And she said, with all respect, I decline. I decline, I'm not doing it. So the president have to go for us to follow him. And I loved it when she said, with all respect, I decline, Mr. President, I decline. Because she understood that even though the president says she should go first, there were other ministers, senior men, sitting on the table watching her. And I can tell that the president was also watching. Even though he said, go, ladies first. If she had gotten up and gone first, he would have said, eh. I mean, that is Africa for you. And somebody could have used it later on. That even when the president said, ladies first, she got up to go. Where are you going? Madam, you are too fin, 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 fin like that. You know how we are. Amen? Say an attitude of humility. Humility is not automatic. Pride is. But humility is not. Humility is a decision and humility is work. Tell two people, humility is a decision and is work. And that's why a lot of people are not humble. There's a lot of ignorance and a lot of pride too much arrogance among God's people. And it breaks my heart. You know why we don't give testimonies anymore in the church? God has accomplished and done much for all of us. But one of the reasons why we don't show gratitude and we don't give thanks and we don't give testimonies is because of pride and lack of humility. Because we believe that it is our own achievement. I was talking to somebody last night about a situation that came up. And he said, Papa, what do you think? And I said, I have learned by experience that schemers always lose what they achieve in life. And let me say it again. Schemers, people who think they are smart and they always have a way of scheming to get things. One, they don't last. And two, the things they scheme for, they don't hold onto it and keep it to the end. They eventually lose it. You can put your hands together and give God glory for that. A schemer will compromise all his values and principles. A schemer will compromise for anything. He will go to any extent to compromise to get whatever he wants in the now. But it's just a matter of time it will catch up with you. 
So when I see schemers, I laugh at them. And I've seen, I've seen people, I've seen schemers. Schemers in the church. Schemers in the political field. Schemers at the marketplace. And they scheme to get things. And that's what the Bible says, fret not thyself for evil doers. And for the man who achieves or gets wealth by mischief, they diminish, but it's a matter of time. And the greatest temptation I have been through, and I still go through, is long-suffering, waiting till God avenges you. That waiting thing is the most difficult one. I'm telling you. I don't care how much you speak in tongues, how much scripture you know. If you can't wait, you are not mature. If you can't wait for God to vindicate, if you can't wait for God to avenge you, you are an amateur. And if you don't know how to restrain yourself as a father, the devil can provoke you to curse your children. I'm telling you. I've seen it over and over again that he can provoke you to curse even your biological children or your spiritual children. And you have to learn long-suffering to hold yourself Restrain yourself, shut your mouth, hold your peace, and let time deal with it. Because vindication is in the womb of time. Put your hands together and give God praise. <clears throat> if we can learn to wait, if we can learn to wait, God will always avenge us. That's what the Bible said. He that believeth shall not be in haste. We are in haste because we don't believe that vengeance is the Lord. But if we believe that vengeance is God and he will repay, we will not be in haste. I have seen great people rise and I've seen great people fall. And I've seen people like a mighty tree spreading their branches with leaves all over, blowing their horn, thinking that they are power and that the law is on their side and they can do whatever they please because it is their turn to do as they please. And they forget. They forget. They forget that every power and every position has expiry date. And even life does. And they don't know their expiry date. So when I see men boast and make noise and are arrogant, and just get up and talk anyhow and especially play with God's church and play with the servants of God. It scares me because they don't know what they are dealing with. You can play with fire. <laughs> church, let's humble ourselves. Let's go ahead. Let's look at some few scriptures. Colossians 3.12. Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as the elect of God, mm -hmm. holy and beloved, mm -hmm. Put on tender mercies. Listen to the word put on. It's like your clothes, your shoe, your coat, winter coat. When it's winter time, you go to Europe or the West, you must put on your winter coat. Other than that, the cold will kill you. Put on. Put it on. So it's not on you, but it's available. It's there. Put it on. Tell somebody, put it on. Go ahead. Put on tender mercies, mm -hmm. kindness, mm -hmm. humility, mm -hmm. meekness, mm -hmm. and long suffering. These are coats. Tell them they are coats. They are coats. Yeah, yeah, they are coats. And they are available, but you have to put it on. You have to put it on. I have a lot of scriptures, so I'm going to run through fast. First Peter 5 5 and 6. Likewise, ye younger, mm -hmm. submit yourselves unto the elder. Submit, submit yourself. The youth, the youth. The youth, submit yourself. Youth, submit yourself. The fact that you know something your father and your mother don't know does not give you the audacity to misbehave mm. at all. My phones can do a lot of things. My phone can do my iPhone. It does things. And sometimes when my children tell me the things the iPhone does, it, it amazes me. But I'm holding it. All I do is to take calls and WhatsApps every now and then and texts and, and I don't know how to use it for other things. But they manipulate that thing. They do all kinds of things with it. And, but I'm still that. 
The fact that you know something I don't know don't make you a father. Father has nothing to do with uh, knowledge only. No, 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 no. It's a divine ordinance. It's a, it's a divine ordinance and appointment. Are you hearing me? Yeah. I was praying with a president friend of mine yesterday, and at the point of the prayer, I said, Mr. President, I want you to make this confession with me. Say, Jesus Christ, you are my Lord, and you are my Savior, and I submit to your saving power and to your Lordship as others look up to me. I look up to you as my King, as my Lord, and as my President. And I said, I'm not taking any chances. Any opportunity I have, it doesn't matter your status in life. I will lead you to Christ knowingly and unknowingly. I will let you confess Jesus. An assembly of God pastor went to preach on Sunday evening. And as soon as he entered into his hotel, when he came back from preaching, Jesus appeared in his hotel room and said to him, come with me. And Jesus took him to hell. And when they got to hell, he showed him hell, that hell is real. And showed him people who didn't believe in God and in Christ. People who were living, doing their own thing, and they lived just to achieve and to make money. Saw them in hell. And he said, keep following me. And he took him to another place in hell. And he saw his roommate in hell. And he asked him, well, what are you doing here? And his roommate said, I came here on Friday, last week Friday. He said, what happened? He said he had an accident and he came here last week Friday. And Jesus said, follow me. And he brought him back to his body. Watch this. Then he looked at the time, it was Sunday night. It was late. The mother was very fan of that friend and roommate. So in the morning, he called the mother and said, Mom, how are you? And the mother said, fine. Then the mother said, have you heard? Your roommate died last week, Friday, in an, ac in an accident. And he said, I know. And the mother said, huh? He said, Jesus took me to hell, and I saw him there last night. And he said he got there on Friday. Do you know how many of your roommates, your neighbors, your siblings, and your loved ones that will go to hell if you shut your mouth and you don't do something? And that is where the church is today. We're not winning souls anymore. We don't care about others anymore. It's all about us. We are using God. We don't want God to use us. We are using God. We want God's blessings. We want his protection. We want long life. And we want health. Why do you want health? Why do you want long life? Why do you seek God's protection? For what? For you to live a life you want to live? To fulfill your agenda and not his agenda? If anybody finds the cure of cancer or the cure of AIDS, and you don't make it available to help people, the world will call you wicked. And salvation is a good thing that we have discovered. But the greatest sin of all of us is the fact that we are not selling the cure of sin. We are not sharing God's goodness and love with others. We are not sharing the steadfast love of the Lord and his message that never comes to an end and the greatness of his faithfulness. We condemn people. We condemn people. We judge them. We are critical of people when the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. We don't tell of his love to others. We don't share his love, his renewed message, his faithfulness. We don't share it with anybody. We kept the good news to ourselves. And many of our schoolmates, our siblings, our neighbors, and our loved ones and our siblings are dying every day and going to hell. And God is depending on you and I to do something. And yet we ain't doing anything. And you know why? Because of pride. It's arrogance. Because one of the things pride and arrogance and self-achievement does is to make you selfish. 
selfish. Where it's always about your reputation. It's about you. You don't want to offend anybody. You don't want to hurt anybody. You want to be politically correct. So all the time, you are thinking about yourself, your reputation, and what people will think of you if you, if you challenge them and if you confront them with the message of God's love. We don't want to win souls. And we were not saved to just be blessed. No. The reason why we are blessed is for the ministry and for the salvation of people. Everything God does for you and I is for others. It is, God never intended to bless you or to bless me for me or for you. It's always about others. It's always about souls and it's always about the ministry. How we live in this world matters for eternity. What we become in eternity has a lot to do with the life we are living and the opportunities we have in life, the resources we have. What are we doing with the resources and the privileges we have in life? What are we, what are we gathering it for? What are we holding it for? What are we hiding for? What are we blessed? It's about others. And if we can't use it for others and for the ministry, we are wicked people. Like the servant who buried his talent. A lot of us are gifted in many ways. But we are not using what God has given us for the benefit of the ministry. And for the salvation of others. It's all about us. And it's all about a rainy day. We think about security. About our future. So we hold it. We hold back what we, could, we can release to advance the ministry. And to touch souls. And to reach the nations we hold it back and many are suffering not because there is a lack on earth but because of a few selfish individuals everybody is lacking and dying may god help us this morning amen likewise you younger submit yourself to the elder mm -hmm. yea all of you be subject one to another mm -hmm. and be clothed with humility be clothed again clothed wear it put it on go ahead for god resisted the proud this is not god resist he didn't say the devil when the devil resists you you can counter you can raise a counter resistance but when god adonai resists you and blocks you nobody can deliver you and the Bible said, those who are proud and arrogant in this life, God will resist you. And there are so many people in life eh, whom God himself is resisting them because they are out of order. They are out of order and their attitude stings a bone, a geophone. Hmm. Somebody say, hmm. It's just a graphic way to explain to you what pride is. God dislikes it taste. Go ahead. God resisted the proud and giveth grace to the humble. God will give grace to the humble. Humble yourself therefore under the mighty arm of God that he may exalt you in due time. God exalts the humble and resists the proud. I don't care who you are. If you are a proud person, God himself will oppose you. And I'm very, very careful of praying for people these days because sometimes you can, you can put yourself in harm's way when you pray for certain people without having understanding of why, why they are going through what they are. Sometimes it's just God himself resisting them to get them to humble themselves. Proverbs 3.34 Surely... He scorns the scornful, mm -hmm. but he gives grace to the humble. The scornful, pride people are very arrogant people. They despise others. They have no respect and value for anybody but themselves. If your arrogance and if your confidence is derived from access or knowledge or skill or experience or accomplishment, or material gains, then you are, you, are, you are to be pitied among all men. I'm telling you. For a man's life does not consist by the abundance of things he possesses. I'm telling you. I have respect for people who are blessed, achievers in life, and yet are down to earth. One of the greatest signs of spirituality is for one and maturity 
is for one to be successful in life and yet maintain the common touch. Yes. Yes. Where well, you can deal with people in high places and you can also deal with ordinary people and treat them as people and as human beings. It's very powerful. It's very powerful. And the reason why God has blessed a lot of us and we can't even show it, we can't tell our message. We can't tell the story. And even if we don't want to tell it, we, we don't even show it by doing something for the ministry and the house of God for the benefit of others. It's because we assume that we, we take credit for the accomplishment. We take credit for what we have and who we are. We believe that we have achieved something because we are disciplined. We have principles. Hey, you're talking about principles? And you're talking about discipline? Give me a break. For the rest is not to the swift, nor reaching to men of skill or understanding, nor the battle to men of strength. But chance and time happens to all. Are you hearing me, somebody? And it is not him that willeth, nor him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. And he said, I will have mercy on whom I will. So I know you have accomplished things. I know you are successful, but take it easy. Because sometimes all we have used in our life by the time we die is 30% of our capacity and mental capabilities. And 70 to 80% is on tap and on use because of pride and arrogance. But if you are emptied, if you are a man emptied of ego, stripped of ego, no accomplishment is enough. I'm always dreaming. As I'm standing, I'm building in my mind. I'm looking at possibilities of doing new things. I have left this building. This building, I left here a long time ago. I'm in another building. I'm dreaming something bigger and better. And many buildings, lands, things. I'm dreaming all the time. I'm a dreamer. Because nothing I have accomplished or have is enough. And the reason why it's not, it's not enough is because I didn't accomplish it. I am just an instrument, a vehicle, and a tool, and a vessel in the hands of the master. That's all. And I can't take credit for anything. Every day is another day, an opportunity for me to do something better and something new for the benefit of others. I don't know about you. Come with me to James 4, 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Again, you see scripture, interpreting scripture. From one scripture to another scripture, God keeps saying the same thing, that me, I resist the proud. I don't like proud people. I don't like proud people. And me, I detest proud people. I have pastors and I have bishops and I have members of my church. I don't hate them but they will never come into my inner court because they are very arrogant and proud people and they don't even know they are proud. They don't know it, but I see the symptoms. I see it because they are never thankful. They argue with you over everything. They take credit for every little achievement. They don't know how to show an attitude of gratitude. They are not grateful about everything and nothing. They are always complaining. They are always looking for their own. And when they are blessed, they hide it from you. They don't even want you to know that somebody in the church has blessed them. They keep it and they hide it. And when you ask them, they act like, why do you want to know? Why do I want to know? When you are blessed in my house, a house that I has built. Now, I know someone that said, well, we have helped you to build. You, you helped me to build, but you didn't build it. You are a helper. You came to help me. It's not yours. I'm the builder, you are helping me. So if you get blessed in my house, I must know. Then you are congregation members who lack understanding, who just get up and they do whatever they want to do. They just give and bless people around you without you knowing to empower them to misbehave. And when you tell them that is the wrong way of doing it, if you want to bless any of my sons, let me know. You have my blessing to bless them, but let me know. They say, why must you know? It is our blessing. I can do what I want to do. You can do what you want to do. So you want to go against divine order. 
and you want to set confusion in my house because God has blessed you. Go ahead. I'm, I won't find you. You two people will rise up in your kingdom one day and they'll bring this order to your kingdom. If you think that just because you are blessed, you can do what you can do whatever you want to do. There are protocols in the house of God. And the Bible says God resisted the proud. At the mouth of two and three witnesses, every word is established. Come with me, please, to Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the Lord be high, uh -huh. yet hath he respect unto the lowly. But the proud he knoweth afar off. Hey, he said, though God is far above, he has respect for the humble people. If you are humble or you have an attitude of humility, even though God is higher and far, he has respect for you. And he said, but for the proud who think they are high, God says, even though I'm high and above, I'm far from you. I don't know you. I'm far from you. I don't know why you are very quiet this morning. But if you are not a sex expert, at least say something. Come with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Quickly. If my people which are called by my name. Not if the heathens, not if politicians. Not if politicians that we are always attacking. But if my people, God is speaking to his people, not politicians. Go ahead. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves mm -hmm. and pray. You see? So the reason why a lot of people don't pray, they don't come to any prayer meeting, they don't attend fasting, they don't attend Friday all night, won't come to early morning prayer meeting, don't attend any prayer meeting, is because of pride and arrogance. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Because I've seen people, and most of time I watch, I've watched a lot of things so for this. 42 years of preaching, I've watched things. And I see people when they are struggling in life, how they will come to every prayer meeting. And now as soon as they break through, they become very busy and very important to attend prayer meetings. Somebody asked me the other day, I've been watching you on YouTube for years. And I want to ask you a question. You are very intense when it comes to prayer. And what makes you pray the way you pray? And I said, the afflictions and adversities of life. When you see adversity in life, you pray. And you pray more than I pray. And true intercessors don't pray according to time. They pray until they see a change. Until they see the manifestation of the glory. They don't stop praying. And that's why I pray the way I pray. Because there are glories and there are change and things I have to see that I haven't seen yet. And I will not stop praying until I see the change. Put your hands together and give God praise, somebody. Amen. Let's move on. He said, if my people who are called by myself will humble themselves uh -huh. and pray, and so, seek my faith. So, pray, so humility is critical and necessary for effective prayer life. The reason why so many people say, well, how, do I, how, how can I pray like you? You can't pray like me. You can't pray like me. You want to pray my, like me? Face some adversities in life. Uh -huh. David said, when my heart is overwhelming, from the ends of the earth, I will cry out. Unto you, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. The reason why people pray religious prayers. Oh, Father, thou knowest all things. If it is thy will, save me. You only pray that prayer because you are not facing adversity. But when the thing is pinching you, and it's very, very close, and it's a tongue, and it's pinching you, you won't pray. Christ say, help! Somebody shout, help! You see, you can't even do it because you are very comfortable. <laughs> People don't cry anymore in the church. We don't cry. Our prayers don't go with tears anymore. I'm telling you, we are not broken anymore. We are too stiff. There's no affection in our heart. We are not broken. That's why God can't use us. 
We are not broken vessels. Nothing convicts us. No amount of preaching convicts us. We hear the word, we feel convicted a little. By the time we leave the building, it's out of our mind. By the time we get to the car park, we've forgotten. And we don't even play or buy the tapes to hear it over and over again. So there's no conviction in our heart. There's no brokenness. There's no affection. We don't care about anybody. We don't care about our loved ones. We don't care about anybody. It's all about us. We are so selfish. Husbands have become selfish. Wives have become selfish. Children and fathers and mothers and wives, parents. Everybody is onto themselves. Everyone is looking for themselves and not for others. Something is wrong. It's because we are hardened, hardened, cold. No affection. We don't cry anymore. We don't care anymore. We don't show mercy. There's no compassion in our hearts anymore. We sit by people in church who are hurting and we can't even sense it. We can't even feel it. We don't even know it. And everybody is pretending. I know today is Father's Day. And you want to hear a father's message. This is a father's message. Go ahead. If they shall humble themselves and pray and Uh seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So so humility is is a very, very important point. It's critical for us to have an effective prayer life. Humility. Stop taking credit. Stop taking credit for anything you have achieved in this life. And always make it available for the ministry. Make it available. Make sure that if it is a car you have or a pen, whatever you have in this life, make sure you are using it for the benefit of the ministry and others. It's very important. Because one day you will answer for it. And God never He never intended that any one of us should be blessed or be healthy or have a long life for us. It's always about the ministry and the salvation of others. See, I hear you. Philippians 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Mm -hmm. who being the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Uh Uh-huh. And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Humble. Jesus humbled himself. Oh, God humbled himself. Now, turn to somebody and say, if God humbled himself, who do you think you are? Some of you, you can't tell the person. Are you afraid of the person? I'm giving you permission. I am in charge of this class and I can fail you. Tell the person, if Jesus humbled himself... Who do you think you are? Yeah, even Jesus. God humbled himself. God humbled himself. Amen? God himself humbled himself. And because he humbled himself, he was highly exalted. The level of arrogance and pride in the church, among believers and among preachers, it's very scary. Very, very scary. If you look at the level of pride and arrogance, and it's all about self and self and self, self and relevance and importance. And I know, I know it's very difficult because I've been in situations where I've been spited. I've been in situations where I'm spited, I'm, I'm, I'm exploited, taken advantage of and used. And I know the person is using me. I'm, I can tell that this person is using me and at the same time despising me. And the, and the platform he's standing on is my platform and I can pull it under his feet. And I know he's using me. And the Lord says, do nothing. Don't do anything. And my flesh, my flesh, all my flesh, my flesh, my flesh want to fight. I want to show him. And the Lord said, you, you show him what? You, the platform you are standing, didn't I give it to you? But I said, at least you know me. I'm, I'm humbling myself. And he said, you are humbling yourself. You define yourself or I define you. Leave him alone. Don't touch him. Let him do it. 
and it, it, it hurts and it's painful. Yeah, yeah. But I've seen God avenge me when I keep quiet and do nothing. Just there, they come to themselves and say, oh, uh, please, I need to make a correction here. And, and they do the right thing and I just sit quiet there. But that is people. And it's flesh. It's flesh. Punam. People are like that. Short memory. We forget. And even when we remember, we don't show gratitude. Yeah. Anytime God remembers anybody, he does something for them. But we, when we remember, we don't do anything. We just talk and we do nothing. I know preachers, when I bring them to this pulpit and I give them microphone, you hear the things they say about me in my presence. Or when I go to their church, you will be shocked with what they say about me. And yet behind me, when I'm not there, they say something different. They are not weighty. Because if you are weighty and you are heavy, you should be able to say, and I correct things so. But as I grow and mature, I've learned that humility is not to defend yourself and explain yourself even when you are right. Hold your peace. And sometimes it hurts and it's painful when you know people are using you and they are scheming. And yet, you have to hold your peace. It's part of spirituality, spiritual growth and maturity. When you see a father quiet, my father, eh, when we're growing up, sometimes things will happen and he will just bow his head like this. And he will shake his head. And then he will say, hmm. And sometimes I'll push him. And I say, Papa, Aden. Then he will make a statement in tree. A Quran no being a bida. An opinion no being a bida. A Quran no be a bida. Then he will bow his head. It is when, after he passed, I began to understand a lot of things. Why sometimes he won't talk about some things. And I watch all my siblings he had issues with. And he won't talk about them. I've seen all of them died. And he used to tell me, say, Nico, Nico, can you know what they are not correct. Don't follow them. Keep humbling yourself. And my father was not born again. He wasn't born again. I, I was bold to lead him to Christ. But whether he lived it or not is another matter. When Jesus came, we will know. But it's, it's very painful. Numbers 12 and 3. Numbers 12 and 3. A few minutes quickly. Numbers 12 and 3. Now the man Moses was very humble. Mm -hmm. More than all men who were on the face of the earth. The man Moses was very humble. Than all men. This was a very skillful person. A general in Pharaoh's army in Egypt. And yet, though he was a general, he wore the coat of humility. An attitude of humility. Don't let your skill, knowledge and IQ and achievement in life blow you out of proportion. You hurt yourself. Don't let God resist you. God can resist you in life. Eh? When you think you are somebody and you think you have arrived. You know why people get offended easily? It's arrogance and pride. That's why people get offended. Because if you're a humble person, things won't offend you. Even this preaching I'm preaching today, eh? it will offend some people. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It will offend some people because they don't like my style and they don't want me to present it the way I'm presenting it. They think I should present it in a particular way on their terms. No, 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 I won't. Because you are not my Lord nor my Master. Jesus is. Amen? I have to present it. And the Word of God is not negotiable. It's not. Amen. Come to Exodus 4.10 quickly. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, 
I am not eloquent. I am not eloquent, and yet he was. The scripture said he was skillful, very eloquent in all the ways of Egypt, and a general. And yet when he stood before the Lord, he recognized his limitations. He recognized his limitations and said, God, I am not eloquent. I'm not good like people say I am. Not before you. I'm inadequate. It's humility. Go ahead. Neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, mm -hmm. but I am slow of speech I'm and slow of a to slow speak. tongue. Slow tongue. And he wasn't. Amen. Go ahead. Second... Samuel 7, 18. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord, mm -hmm. and he said, Who am I? Who am I? O Lord God. A king, oh, this was a king. A king. Go ahead. And what is my, my house that thou hast brought me hither to? You see, he, he, some people in life, eh, when they get blessed, then they start looking at the history of their family. And they, they want to now ascribe the success and the grace and the mercy that God has shown them to something in their family. That they are who they are and have come to where they are because of something their family did or somebody in their family was very special and something. You know something? Stop it all. Stop it. Stop it and, and humble yourself. I'm telling you. And just accept that you, eh, God has shown you mercy. And God has been good to you. And God has decided to show mercy. For it is not him that willeth, nor him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. I will have mercy on whom I will. It has nothing to do with anybody in your family, what any grandfather or grandmother did. It has nothing to do with it. It's God's mercy. Be humble. I'm telling you. You can clap if you want to. Just humble yourself. That's all. Amen. Hmm? Yeah. Proverbs 16 and 5. Few scriptures quickly. Let's just run through and, and close. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Anyone Lord. Anyone that is proud in his heart stinks before the Lord. You stink. Ubong. Can, can. Mm. <clears throat> Did I say that? That is how bad pride is. That is the best way I can describe it. Mm. Ubong. Anyone who is proud and arrogant before God, you stink. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter the amount of perfume you use. And you can live in a marble house, in a granite house. It doesn't matter the car you drive in, you stink. And it doesn't matter the school you attended. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you. You stink. It says, though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. You see, God is saying here that me, God, I punish proud people. I punish them. So if you are a proud person, it doesn't matter who you are, a believer, non-believer, God said, I will punish you. If you're a preacher, a politician, a businessman, a lawyer, a doctor, a professional, it doesn't matter who you are. God said, I will punish you. I will make sure you go unpunished. I'll deal with you. You will not go unpunished. I will make sure you don't go unpunished. I will make sure I deal with you in this life. It's a very serious thing to be proud. And yet, do you know why people don't give thanks? People don't give thanks or show gratitude to God or the work of God because of pride. Some people boldly can decide I'm not doing anything in the church. And I won't tithe. I won't support the church. I won't join any group. I won't join the, the, the cells. I, I'm, I'm too big. I, I'm too big. You know what I'm saying? I'm big. I'm big. You are big. Do you know how big you are? Go to the mortuary. Yeah, yeah, go to the mortuary, you see how big you are. Yeah, if you go to the mortuary and you see how they handle people's body, human beings, you will stop being all arrogant. You know all these watches and shoes and things we are acquiring and all this secret money we are hiding, 
Folks, if you know the end of it, eh, and who will come and enjoy it when you die, you will give it to the Lord to give you eternal rewards. I'm telling you. I've seen people very powerful in this church. Very, very powerful. Who could have done things for the kingdom to give them eternal mileage. And they were doing things for themselves, achieving things, buying properties, doing big things, big manism and names. I just leave them alone, left them alone. And when some of them died, I'm, look, I'm seeing the people enjoying what they sweated and worked for. And it breaks my heart. But if I have told them when they were alive, they will tell them, Papa, are you cursing me? So you just keep quiet. Just leave them alone. Tell him. Let's humble ourselves, though, because life is a gift. And let's use it for good. And how we live matters for eternity. Let's do the right thing. Let's do the right thing. You will go far. I'm telling you. I have a gentleman that he, he, he went on retirement. And even after he went on retirement, his office said, go on retirement, but we still want to maintain you. We need you. By law, you're on retirement, but we still need your services. You see, when you are a humble person, people will always need you. And, and the kingdom, and God, God is on way home. Even when you have nothing to offer, if you're a humble person, eh, God will always preserve you and keep you. <clears throat> because humility is a beautiful aroma. Beautiful aroma. Sometimes you send a perfume around people and you ask them, what, what is the name of the perfume you are using? That is what humility is. It's a beautiful aroma when you're a humble person. But there are some perfume to when you wear it, it's why like that. And, and, and I, some people, when they put on something, they come around me and say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I'm, 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 can, I, can I be excused, please, please, please? There are some perfume to when you smell it. What, what is the name of your perfume? That's what humility is all about. Let's humble ourselves. Let's work for God. Let's save souls. Let's, let's be involved in the ministry. Let's do things for, the, for God. And remember how we live matters for eternity. Don't live anyway, anyhow. And you will not live forever. So live for God. Work for God. Isaiah, let me leave that. Isaiah, no. Let me just go to another scripture quickly because of time. My time is up. Uh, come with me to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 35. From verse 20 to 24. And, and I think I will stop here. Go ahead. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple. Josiah was one of the greatest kings of Egypt, of, of Israel. Did great things for God. And he's caring that you can do great things for God and not end well. And it's one prayer all of us pray, and I pray that I will end well. Amen. How we end is very important. How you end is more important than how you began. Right. Amen. Go ahead. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came to fight against Necho. Kakemish. Now, this, 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 eh, this was a hidden king, an idol worshiper. You see, this is where, this is where eh, humility means everything. An attitude of humility will save you. Yeah. And this is where you have to choose between humility and pride. Now, look at what. Why this king died prematurely? Look at why he died prematurely. Foolishness. Foolishness. That was all. Pride. Arrogance. Presumption. And a prejudiced attitude. Go ahead, look at something. Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Kakemish by Euphrates. Mm -hmm. And Josiah went out against him. Uh -huh. but he did, he, did, did the Bible say he came to fight Josiah? No. Talk to me. Did he come to fight Josiah? No. Tell somebody, mind your own business. Mind your own business. You know, one of the problems in the church, eh, people take up fights that don't concern them. It's very dangerous. Sometimes you see a congregation member having a fight with the pastor. 
or with the leader of the church and you side with them without knowing the details of the situation you just side with them and become a partaker of the sins of others you must learn to mind your own business i'm telling you he didn't mind his own business he went and took up a fight that didn't concern him and died prematurely and look at what led him to his premature death look at it but he sent ambassadors to him saying what he have... sent the hidden king sent his ambassadors to go and talk to the king of israel that i don't have a problem with you you and i have no fight i'm not coming against you and my battle is not with you but with another house don't cross me. Stay out of my way. And listen to what he said. And look at why Josiah died untimely dead. Look at it. What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? He said, king of Judah, I don't have anything to do with you. I have no fight with you. I'm minding my own business. Go ahead, listen. I came not against thee this day. He said, I haven't come against you this day. I have no fight with the house of God. Go ahead. But against the house wherewith I have war. He said, I have a war with another house, not with you. I have for, no fight with you. For God commanded me to make haste. This was where Josiah missed it. This was a hidden king. Oh. He wasn't mm, a Hebrew. Mm, he wasn't a believer. Mm, he was an unbeliever and a hidden king. And had the audacity to say, you king of Judah, you, God should have used you to do this, but your God whom you serve, has commanded me to leave Egypt and to come all the way from Egypt and come and fight another house. Your God commanded me. Josiah had issues with that. You know something? We can't tell God who we should use. I'm telling you. And that is where humility comes. Because God created good and evil. He said, I kill and I make alive. So God can do whatever he please. He's God by himself. His ways are not our ways. His, his thoughts are not our thoughts. God can use even the devil. He uses the devil. Who crucified Jesus? Who crucified Jesus? The Bible said it pleased God to bruise him. But physically speaking, it was the devil who did it through men. But God used the devil to carry it out. Because the Bible said, if the princes of this world have known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. So God deployed Satan to carry out his plans. He can use anybody. And you cannot tell God who he should use and who he shouldn't. That is where humility comes to play. And this scripture is a very, very scary scripture. There are some scriptures in the Bible that scares me. Eh? This is one of them. And I'm an archbishop, I'm an archbishop, and I'm telling you that some scriptures in the Bible scares me. And this is one of them. That you can miss it like that. No matter how anointed you think you are, no matter how much you are invested in scripture, you can miss it if you are proud and arrogant. Because the same scriptures can make you arrogant and proud. Your achievements can make you arrogant and proud. Go ahead. He said, forbear thee from meddling with God. Who he is said, with me? He said, don't get involved in this thing. Because if you get involved, eh, you will be interfering with the purposes of God. Don't do it. King of Judah, don't do it. Go ahead. He said, keep from meddling with God. Who is with me? He that said, you think you are the king of Judah? I'm an idol worshiper. But the God you claim to be your God is with me. And if you, if you interfere, your God, who is with me, will deal with you. Go ahead, look at it. Your God who is with me, that he, made, that he destroy thee not. That, that your God destroy you not. Hey! Somebody say, hey! Come on, talk to me. Do it, man. We say, hey! Hey, it's carrying on. Somebody say, hum, hum, hum. Uh -huh. Go ahead, look at Nevertheless, this. Josiah would not turn his face from him. He would not turn from him. But he disguised himself uh -huh. that he may fight with him uh -huh. and hearken not unto the words of Neko from the mouth of God. He would not hearken the voice of Neko. to the what? 
voice of Neko. To the what? Words of Neko. To the words of the hidden king of Egypt. From the mouth of God. From the mouth of God. How? Turn to someone and say, how? How? You see? But that is where humility comes in. That God can choose to use anybody he wants to. God didn't speak by him. He chose to speak by a hidden king. You see, sometimes eh, we have to just allow God to do his thing. You, know? you see, that's why this thing about false prophets eh, and some of these prophets who are misbehaving and things, that's why sometimes people will come, Papa, you are the Papa, say something, do something, and I just keep quiet. And it's not because I'm, 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 I don't understand what I know. Because these things happen in the times of Jesus, in the times of the apostles. But time has a way to weed them all out. And sometimes you have to be very, very careful how you handle some of these things. Because it can lead. Sometimes the people you are going to deliver them can even get up and fight you. Yeah. So you have to be very, very careful. You have to be very careful. Because in trying to correct it, you may create more problems. So sometimes you just have to let time, 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 time deal with it. And even when you are dealing with it, you have to be very, very humble and very careful that you don't, in the midst of it, miss it. Judge not that you may not be judged. Who are you to judge another man's servant? We have to be very careful sometimes. When we think we have power and we, we are righteous people, we know we are educated, we have the light, we know the best, law is on our side, we can do as we please. Who told you? Who told you that? You. You. Who told you that? A man who lives today and tomorrow you wither like the flower, the flower and the grass of the field. And you are talking. You are just talking arrogantly. And you don't even know of your tomorrow. Somebody say, mercy, Lord, mercy. Nevertheless, Jephthah would not turn his face from him, but disguise himself that he may fight with him and hearken not unto the words of Neko from the mouth of God and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo and the archers shot at King Josiah and the king said to his servants, have me away for I am so wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had and they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died, and was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. It was, it was a foolish death. Tell two people, don't die foolishly. Don't die foolishly. Don't die foolishly. A lot of people die foolishly. That is what pride and arrogance can do to you. It can kill you foolishly. Josiah shouldn't have died at all. He shouldn't have died. It was unnecessary for him to die. He should have just accepted by humility that God, you can use anybody you want to use. It's your business. I am here. You could have used me, but you chose to go to Egypt to go and take Neko, Neko, a hidden king, an idol worshiper. Speak through him and use him. It's your business. You are God. I'm minding my own business. He could have been alive. But his problem is that how can God use a hidden? I will not accept it. This guy is fooling with me. He's trying to play some smart game with me here. I will go out after him and destroy him. Prove to him that we are the chosen people. Who told you you are the chosen people? When Israel was coming out of Egypt, there was another prophet nobody knew of him. Another prophet. He wasn't part of them. He didn't come with them from Egypt. And he was a prophet. On their way to the promised land, there was a prophet. And he was a prophet of God. And we didn't know where he came from, but he was a prophet. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have an attitude of humility. It will take you far. It will take you places. Let's learn to show gratitude. Let's learn to be thankful. Let's stop taking credit for our achievement in life. Let's humble ourselves. Let's take it easy. Last scripture. Daniel chapter 4, verse 30 and 31. Go ahead. 
the king spake and said, mm -hmm. It's not this great Babylon. That this is I this have is built. this is this is a king, the king of Babylon speaking, the book of Nazar. Listen. This, it's not this great Babylon. It's not this great achievement of mine. Look at what I have done. I have me. built for Look the house of awards. The king. Look at the awards I have received in life. The importance, the invitations. I'm on the international scene. I'm very, very important. The international community respects me. You know something? Being respected by the international community means nothing if your own people don't respect you. So don't be fooled. Is this not great Babylon that I have built for the house of my king of the kingdom by the might and of my power? By the might of my power, my skill, my education, my background, my importance. You know, I was talking to somebody recently. He's always talking about people who have been to this school and to that school and have a and I said, you have a tendency of always overblowing people who have higher education in life. And I said it's a wrong attitude. It's a wrong attitude. You have to learn to treat human beings for who they are. And it has nothing to do with their background. Treat people as people. Go ahead. And for the honor of my majesty. The honor of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, uh -huh. there fell a voice from heaven saying, uh -huh. O King Nebuchadnezzar, uh -huh. to thee it is spoken, the uh -huh. kingdom is departed from thee. Hey! Somebody say, Hey! Somebody say mercy. In conclusion, let me restate these points and facts. Please write them down. Stanford University Research Center has established that 12 and half percent of success in life is derived from knowledge, skill, and IQ. 87 and half percent of the successes we attain in life is a result of an attitude. Charles Swindon said, Attitude is more important than your past, than education, than money, than circumstances. An attitude is important than what people do or say. It is more important than giftings, skills, and is more important than relevance. My Angelo said, if you can't do something about what you don't like, first of all, he said, if you don't like something, change it. And if you can't do anything about it, change your attitude. If you don't like something, change it. And if you can't do anything about it, change your attitude. 